Thank you for joining us here on the Frank Sontag Podcast. A brand new location, a brand new setup, and we are so excited to bring this to you. You can find us at all the usual places, on YouTube, we're on social media, on Instagram, etc., etc. So let me tell you a short story and then introduce my guest. A lot of you know of my days of being a new age teacher, and during that time, I did a number of different things, one of which would be called, I guess, a life coach, where in, in my uh, ideal circumstance, I would just come alongside somebody and just, you know, help them and mentor them and hang out with them. And I don't remember how m- my good friend who's here, how we began, maybe I announced it and we emailed or whatever, but my guest is a man named Craig Parker Adams. And in fact, let's welcome on. Craig, it's good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Thanks Glad to be being here. here. My pleasure. Thank you. So let me kind of finish the story. So Craig and I make a connection, and he tells me he's a has a recording studio in Hollywood, which is a landmark, Winslow Court, mm. which I don't think is there anymore. Well, the building is, the business isn't. So it's it's still in you know whatever chaos since the last five years when they evicted the whole you know complex, um, and then the historical society blocked the sale you know so it, it there's a limbo going on but the bottom line is the building is still there and it's sitting vacant and has been for the last five years and winslow has been around when did it start how far back well Wins- winslow court is the name of my personal business so i was well actually it was a friend of mine who named the studio that it was that's the name of the street i grew up on back in minnesota cool so um and i wrote a piece of music called that and he didn't he heard the piece of music and liked it. And then one day I showed up at the studio and it had a sign on it painted and it said Winslow Court Studios. And I'm like, oh, that's the name. Okay, wow. And then I was like, I don't, do you know what that even really means? And then explained it to my friend Bo, you know. Um, but so that's how that even happened. So I didn't name it, he did. Um, but originally it was one of the RCAs. It was a Columbia. It was, it was built, it was, it was a, Built turn of the century, early 1900s, one of the first sound recording studios built in the world for sound for film. So it had a Foley pit floor, you know, that opened up with all the different surfaces and they'd watch the movie and then record all the sounds, you know, the sound effects for the film. I'm jumping around. Is that the room that we got, you got married in? Yes. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So. I know, yeah. So let me interrupt if I may. So Craig and I became friends in and just spent time together. And I would go to Winslow Court and just kind of see photos on the wall. I was in rock industry, KLOS, and I'm like, oh, I know that person, I know that person. And Craig and I just would talk about a lot of things, life, music. And then one day, I just want to cut to the chase here, your then girlfriend, your now wife, yeah. I, I, it just dawned on me. Like, I knew you as a recording guy, yeah, but it kind of cross my mind i wonder if he plays anything and so i think i asked you and you're very humble very quiet and maria said go to youtube and uh type in craig parker adams right and the first thing i saw was you uh with a guitar doing eruption right van halen's eruption right some of our audience really knows who van halen is some of our audience doesn't have any idea but the point being i'm like okay so you, you're a, a musician, songwriter, singer, guitarist, a man of many hats. And so I wanted to have you on just to kind of chop it out and talk about life and music. And you've brought your guitar in and spirituality and even something as um, thought provoking as adoption, which yeah. is uh, something very special in your heart. Yeah. Uh, his his album is called uh, Vistale Buell. I don't know if we can get that on camera. And it's brand new. He's not here to, to hawk it, but I I have it, and I wanted to make mention of his album. CraigParkerAdams.com is his website. And so let's just kind of jump in. So talk about your your life of music, your affinity to, of all things, a guitar. Um, well, music for me was just always there in my life. It really just was always uh, present. Um, 
And uh, one thing that you mentioned about uh, the adoption and why that is something that's special to me is because it really was kind of a part of my life from the very beginning. So I was put up for adoption, um, ended up in foster care as an infant, basically, and um, then eventually was placed with the people, my parents, who raised me. That's my family, you know. Um, and it, 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 when that all of that went down, um, the early years for me, something that I, I kind of wanted to point something out, and if, for those of you maybe who have been adopted or, or who aren't or maybe looking to adopt or whatever, how, wherever you would fit into this dynamic, we'll say, one thing that was very prominent for me growing up from my very first thoughts, like, which literally, and I'm going to go back to the infant type age, you know, um, pre-toddler was, is that I was in an environment where nobody in my family carried the same blood. Wow. Nobody. Five people in a household, all from different families. None of us were blood related. Three of us looked a lot alike. Two of us didn't look alike, you know, the parents were short with dark hair and the kids were, you know, blondes and tall and all of this kind of stuff. And, and so it was real easy to kind of look around and go, hmm, I don't feel connected to this. I don't feel connected to that or, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And that was very prominent in my life. And so I did a lot of living in my head. Mm -hmm. And this is why um, this is a big leap. But this kind of relates, I'll just say, to God, to source, to whatever it was. Because I was internal, I was having my, it's not like I was having conversations with myself, but I felt connected to something. And that's what I was, that was that's kind of what I gravitated to. And then as I started to grow older and older, and what I mean, what I mean by that is three, four, okay, that age, where you know, you have full on language, you're speaking, you're talking, um, you're seeing your older siblings and how they did. There's a big age gap as well. So it, you know how you're just a sponge as you're coming up, you know, and you're, and I think I had a, a, a level of awareness where I was kind of deciding, like, do I want to absorb this? No. Do I want to absorb this? Yeah. Like I, I could look at things real easy and go, I want to do this. I don't want to do that. Because of that dynamic, it made things very crystal clear for me. Now, as it go, to to stay in the, in the lane of music, um, it was all around. All five people had different musical things going on. Very interesting. My father was a quartet singer in a barbershop quartet. Okay. And my mom was a sweet Adeline singer, which is the female version of that, but in a choral cor chorus, you know. Um, so they were both singers and they were active singers. They were active in terms of people would come to the house and they'd have rehearsals. They were active where they did gigs, they did performances. Um, there was events and this kind of thing. So I saw that with them. My siblings, brother, sister, um, they were listening to music. So that was just fans of music. And for those of us who grew up in the late 60s, 70s and whatnot, it's just like music was such a huge part of our culture. For sure. And so anyways, and we all had our, our own styles, things that we liked and whatever. So um, it was all around um, the pull for an instrument really started happening when I was like about three or four or something in that range, um, where my mom said I started asking for a guitar. But what's crazy is, is I just recently, tr my, both my parents have now passed on. My parents were together, the parents who raised me, they were together for 62 years. Wow. I mean, and my father was a farmer from Wisconsin. My mom was a Catholic schoolgirl from the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, right? Yin and yang almost. They met, the, he, he, within three months, he, my father proposed to her. Within six months, they were married. I mean, in 1956. Mm -hmm. Unreal. So I, I scored. My view is I got the best parents in the, on earth. That was my deal. They, like I said, they both have passed on. 
And, and fortunately, I was there for each of their last moments to give them everything I could that they gave me. So my adoption situation, I look, it's kind of like a gold coin that never leaves my pocket because I was raised in the grace of two people that said, you call me mom, you call me dad. Okay. And we're going to take this forward. And that's just the way it is. Mm. This is your brother. This is your sister. And then of course the whole, this, you know, the morals, this is how, you know, they gave me their example by, you know, and so it was very, very special. So I always, everything that I look at always comes from, that's my filter. That's my lens. Like God, that's how I view it. God gave me two parents right out of the gate. I mean, he didn't, but this, this is a different, the, the, it, this, my story goes to something quite more profound after my mom passed away. I'll share um, at later. But so I always view things at, from gratitude. Like I could still be in foster care. Yeah. You know, also too, along my way, and um, throughout my life, and how you and I came to meet, which is a very funny story, <laughs> because I reached out to you because I, I, I fell in love with your voice listening to the show on Sunday nights because of that's what was going on in my life at that time. I was always working, so I was wide awake all night long, and it's like finding good radio, talk radio in L.A. was tough. Yep. And that's how I found you. And uh, it, it, uh, it was... I say it was a godsend because I would just sit and listen and, and have the dialogue. And then there'd be times I'd be yelling at the radio. I'd be all mad and sure. frustrated. And, and, and that was, I love that. That was the spice of, of the dialogue. For those that don't know, I did a late night talk show Sunday nights on KLOS for 21 years from midnight to five commercial free. And, uh, those were mostly my new age days. So yeah. continue. But as, as a listener, you want to hear a show where the host and the guest can talk. Yeah. And that's what was so awesome because whether, whatever the topic was, you got a piece of some unadulterated conversation that was just off the cuff and to the point. And it's like, that's, you're digging in. Hmm. And, you know, for, for, there's a lot of us, I think, that want to, like, we like to jump in. Like, I don't want to just dilly-dally around the, like, let's get into it. And, and so that was a beautiful thing. It was a big invite. That's how I saw it. And when I reached out to you, and I've mentioned this to you before, I still have the original text that I sent you. So, because you, you would invite either emails or phone calls or texts. And I texted you something that I thought was so clever. Like I was really trying to get at you because I was just <laughs> like, I was, I was a bit perturbed by whatever it was. And um, so, but the way you responded on air was, it just, uh, it basically um, defanged my feel. And I'm like, it, it was even, it made me love you even more. I was like, this is great because you, what I was being pulled to was I needed a mentor. I needed a big brother. I needed somebody to go, uh, check this out. You know, mm -hmm. let me throw a perspective at you. You might not be thinking of, I was, I was screaming for that inside. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know it, but that's what it, that's what it was. That's why we bonded when we met, when I actually first went to one of, of the events. Um, so, and, and you, I think you, you sense that right away and like anybody, you know, you, you try to help the up and comers in any way you can, you know, and, well, that's, and, and in truth, I, I had a fair amount of people reach out to me. I didn't say yes to most of them. Right. Because I was like, no, I want to take this seriously. This is in my mind, even though I had no foundation in the Bible or Christ in my mind, this is like, holy stuff. I got to be really careful with you. It was almost immediately green lights all around. Yeah. There's, there's, we've talked about this where the, it's just a thing, we, we, you know, there's a connection there and whatever it is. And, and it, it is, it is what it is. It's very pure. And, and so I pay attention to those sorts of things when they happen. So, um, but anyways, back to that young stuff coming up in a household where you, you know, you don't see yourself in anybody else. Um, and you know, you have all those di different dynamics and then the age differences and stuff, but then it's like, well, Hey, here's a huge palette of, of, of a wide variety of music. You probably would never be in contact with, you know, so it enriched me. So I, I always reflect on, I, as I look back at my childhood, 
as I've learned as I've grown older, I flip everything into a positive, even the negative. That you do. And you just have to do that because what else do you have? Yeah. You know, it's like, why, why choose a lose scenario? I want a winning scenario. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those were all wins for me, seeing that stuff firsthand on many different levels. The fact that the parents would have people come into the house taught me how to be a host. And that taught me how to run a business, how to uh, you know, treat people when they walk through the threshold and when they're in your space. That's very, very important. I learned that firsthand by watching my parents and how they hosted people when they came to, over to the house. So that was a huge thing for me. Music and the notes and all of that is almost like I view it as talking about, well, let's talk about my fingernails for a second or something. Let's talk about, you know, it's such a part of me that I almost can't, um, it's hard for me to, to see it as something separate from me. Styles and things like that. I see separate than me, you know, different artists and things of that nature, but the notes and music, um, it's, I learned by having my business that it, it like it, it encompasses many things that we experience in our, in, in the physics of our reality. Sound is a big part of it and how you connect with others and the frequencies that the guitar puts out or the drums or this or that or whatever, these things are all very important. So the more I got into it, I started, it went beyond the notes for me and it just turned into a way to exist. Like music is a way to exist. You know, let me, let me jump in, keep that thought. It's interesting driving over here. I was listening to my friend, Dennis Prager on the radio yeah. and he's very vocal about God. Yeah. He's Jewish. Yeah. I'm Christian, mm -hmm. but he said something as he always does, thought provoking. And he said, music, for those that deny God, music is absolutely evidence that God exists. You cannot, it, it, music wasn't like evolved out of the swamp. I mean, there's so much to it. Oh yeah. And you know, we have these expressions, uh, music is universal language, blah, blah, blah. And to jump forward and then you can go wherever you want. When I first saw you playing a guitar, I got to be honest with you. I was shocked. Oh. I was shocked. Like, wait a minute. Like the Craig, I've don't quit your day job. <laughs> no, not that kind of shock. The Craig that I kind of loved on and we had a brotherhood and, and, and leaned into life and did questions and struggles and, and music. I was at KLOS 27 years. So big part of my life growing up, Led Zeppelin, Beatles, blah, blah, blah. But it changed my dynamic with you in my mind. Mm. And so it, it's, I want to be cognizant of a time factor with, with the podcast, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have more to share about where you were going, please do. And also I just, you know, why of all things, guitar and, 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 strong influences. You talked about being raised in a home where there's all sorts of music, but yet I'm going to ask you to, you know, put the guitar on a little bit and play a little bit. And people are going to go, I would think like, Oh, wow. <laughs> Didn't expect that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for putting the pressure. On. Uh, um, well, I can only hope that's, that's basically how I have to view music and how people respond. I, I could get very um, cerebral and get stuck in the, how, what are they going to think? And then at some point I got to that thing where it's like, you know what? It doesn't matter. It has to be honest for me, for, for me to have a real chance for somebody to even like it at all. How many guitars do you have? Um, 20. And what does the guitar mean to you? I mean, it's an instrument, but yet uh, there's so much more to it. There is. Um, well, for, for, uh, okay, so it's it's a device you can use to communicate with, no doubt about it. All right, so there's a lot of that, and this is what makes me think of, uh, you know, the classic, you know, if, if like a hard rock guitar player, and, you know, and you think of the solo or something, you know, and you're gonna think of some somebody with, you know, the long hair and their head cocked back and their mouth wide open and they're making that face and there's all of this, right? So there's that aspect, but then there's also the other side where there, there's no, like you don't see anything happening. Thinking about the music, and, and I think how this relates to 
Christ, God, other things that you were mentioning, because you just actually said a whole bunch that I wanted to respond to and see what I can remember to, to respond to. The thing about music is, is it will take over your biology. It doesn't care about your psychology. That comes second. Your biology responds first. And if I want to put on a noise that's going to make you buckle at the knees and put your hands over your ears in pain, I could do it, right? Or any variation. So the thing is, is sound speaks to you ahead of your operating system. Interesting. So that's why. So when you say in music, harmony, harmony is Christ. That's how I see Christ or Jesus. That's harmony. It's not dissonant and it's not, um, there's no conflict or consternation, you know, where you can put two notes together and it sounds horrible. It'll make your hair stand up on your neck. And then there's other ones you can do where it's just like, man, I could run out to the desert right now, you know, and there's energy that's being transferred. And so that's basically it. The bio, and, and I'm super sensitive to that. So I've always been, I respond to the tonality of, of the energy of the, of the room I'm in, basically. Yep. And it's kind of beyond my control. What is in my control is how I respond to it. In other words, I'm going to have whatever the reaction is going to be, but now I get to choose what am I going to do with my reaction. So I always try to exist in harmony with everything that I do everything, even in music. So um, some folks might find that boring, some might not, whatever. But that's basically how I try to exist. Many years ago, and by the way, this is Craig Parker Adams. This is the Frank Sontag podcast. We're grateful you're watching. Many years ago, I interviewed Patty Boyd, who spent time with George Harrison and Eric Clapton, and she wrote a book on creativity. She interviewed, if I recall correctly, 50 high-profile rock and roll people, asked them about their relationship with creativity. Um, many of us that love music, uh, you know, you hear a song from when you were, you'll hear it on the radio or on whatever you have, and boom, you're back at that time in life. Music is very powerful. Mm -hmm. But where I'm going is, she talked about the creative process and, you know, losing yourself in the music. And... So you love what you do in truth, and yet what has music taught you about you? Mm. Well, everything, because this record, Vistali Buell, that's a term I made up. Um, it's the name of my life's journey, <laughs> as it relates specifically to one artist and my quest to learn from that artist, that artist being Edward Van Halen, a guitar player. Um, Mm. I'm, I'm, let's see here. Well, let me try a different angle. Yeah. Since you brought him up, talk more about your relationship with Ed. You call him Edward. We all know him as Eddie, but you call him Edward out of reverence and relationship. And so w w did you know him? Uh, well, I did later. My, my journey led me to him and, and we became friends. That's what's amazing about the journey, you know, and what that record actually entails, because although it's a 33 and a half minute record, that's just, you know, a rock instrumental rock record, but I would say not like others. Um, it, it's way much more than that because everything that you're asking me, every single second of every note that's in that record was I had to go so deep to get to, to get out of me um, for varying reasons. Um, and so it, it's basically everything because it has the ability to motivate me, to re-energize me, to make me cry, to release uh, any kind of baggage or load. And that's really why this record took me a long time to do because I, Every, I, I was basically psychologically and physically going through things, trying to uh, basically heal from situations and create new fresh notes from those. Do you know, like if, if you could just think of fresh soil to plant your apple tree in, basically, and you're, that's, you went through great um, strength, strains to make sure that that soil is as pure as it could possibly be to give that tree the best chance to give you the sweetest fruit you could possibly grow. It's very detailed. So I was in the dirt 
for the for the, what that record is. Um, and like you said, it it took you a bit of time. It took me well, yeah. To the listener, it's going to sound ridiculous when I say this, but this record took me from from the point of its inception, which is photographed on the back of the record, um, to a moment to when I declared I was going to make this record. It took me forty years, forty years to make this one record, but. I made hundreds and hundreds of records for other artists in that time. So um, th those, those artists have energies. And when you work on other people's stuff, then you're carrying some of those energies. I had to learn how to not do that. So music is literally, it, the focal point of my existence is based around music. That's how I see it now. Um, in how I view my entire life how my attitude is, how my relationships with everybody I know, my diet, my day-to-day, -day, you know, it's, it's, it's my entire life is caught up in it. So, Craig Parker Adams is my guest. Would you do me a favor and just grab the guitar yes, and just do anything that, you know, um, no agenda, no, mus no musical requests, right? Just... Whatever comes through you, just so the listeners and the viewers can kind of get a sense. I'm gonna play the the uh, the the, the, uh, the first track on the record was really cool. I got to actually use um, through the guy who who uh, works on my amps and, and equipment for thirty odd years. His name's Doug Anderson. He um, owns a couple of well, he has a place called the Van Halen Museum in Pasadena, Altadena. And he has a lot of, of gear and things from Ed. And uh, he, one of the things he let me use is one of Ed's old cabinets. So I got to use for the first song on the record, he let me borrow this cabinet and use it. So it sounds super, super cool. So I was just going to, uh, I'll play you what, how the record starts with this killer cabinet. So if you hear it and you hear that cabinet, it's, it sounds really unique. You know, it's just a, it, great cabinet. So anyways, that, this, this tune kind of starts out like this. <laughs> I want to do that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's funny. Craig Parker on, Adams. Thank you. On, on his, uh, on that cabinet, it's just the cabinet, when you hear it, it's got a really cool kind of spank to it. And, you know, when you crank it up real loud, it just, just sounded super cool. So, so following up, I have a friend who, I have a couple friends who are drummers, uh, pretty high profile. I had dinner with one the other night, hadn't seen him in a while. Uh, he's been touring with a band, you know, people that know the r history of rock w would know the band. I, I'm not here to name drop, but we talked about the music industry and how it's changed so much and ever changing. You talked about the 60s and 70s and influential time of music. Now here we are, blink our eyes. It's like five, six decades later. Time is crazy how it goes by. Any observations, anything you want to say in general about the music industry as a whole right now? Have we lost something with technology being ever increasing? Uh, do, do you still, I mean, do you wince when you kind of I mean, talk about the, the industry now and music as it is now? Because I don't want to go long here, but for me, I don't know any new music. I just lock into my old stuff. My son's 15. He'll listen to something, no idea, and then I'll go on Instagram. This person has 100 million followers. I'm so out of touch. Mm. But what about the industry? Is it honoring to, to, the, to the spirit and the power of, 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 of just how music can so move us and change anything in life? It's, I mean, it's really a holy thing. I think the, 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 
the things that we experienced growing up, um, those of us, again, you know, um, I mean, maybe they, they still do now, but basically if you grew up and you had the ability to see a live musical performance as a child in person, it's, there's a very good chance it, it affected you in a profound way. Most musicians that are around, that's how they got into it. Something profoundly happened. They saw something, you know, we'll say the Beatles on Ed Sullivan or whatever it might have been. That was a huge cultural situation. It, it planted a lot of seeds. It's, it's kind of tough to, to differentiate between, I want to do this because I saw it on television and it looks like it'd be bitching and fun, you know, you know or... I got to do this because it's, you know, there's a, there is a line in there. Um, and so I would say that the live musical performance still has the ability to knock your socks off and that can inspire a child for their entire life. If they're, if they see that. So that is still here as it was. What's not here is all in the mechanisms of, of the doing how do we do it and how do you get it played? It's all on, especially the played aspect. It's very much on a lockdown situation. You know that as a, as a DJ that you just didn't have, you saw the freedom. Jim, Jim's hands got tied as the years went on, right? right. He didn't have the ability to play Jim Lad, everybody. Um, that's, uh, you know, so, so that went away basically, but that's been done to us. They changed the formats on us, um, but the notes can still do what they do. So the power's there, but the way it's being delivered, where you get it, the stuff they allow to get through, the big masses get this same stuff all the time. You know, that's all a controlled marketing kind of thing. So, you know, that is what it is. So you got to navigate through it. So maybe the most popular aren't the most aren't the the most talented but that's all subjective correct so he just can't you know to me do did did you did is the is the person you're dealing with inspired about whatever it is that that, that they're doing and then is there are they aiming for something and do they have a stoke for their life and you know these are the signs that i look for um and then in music for me like I always tell people, like people would assume, oh, you moved to California because you wanted to be famous. Right. No, right. I moved to California because I wanted to be by the ocean. <laughs> I wanted to, to see the mountains and I wanted to be by the desert. All of those things. And then inadvertently, yeah, the music stuff's here too. But that's not why I moved here. That will go wherever I go. Music's going to be with me. So I know a lot of... Uh, talented, unknown artists. Yeah. Um, and I, I bow to them every chance I get with respect, um, appreciation, admiration of just, you chose that because you had to do it. Yeah. And so that's something about when an artist has to do it. Um, I don't know. There's, there's, there's something beautiful in that. There's something, uh, uh, purposeful, uh, you know, um, destined or something, you know, uh, I know I'm le there's a lot of gray area to what I'm saying, but basically, I don't know. I see that the industry is distant. Like I'm like you, I don't know a lot of the new artists or whatever, but I'm still working with legacy artists. I have clients that are touring. I'm seeing one tonight. He's on, to they're coming into town for the, you know, they've been on the road to earn the record. And then, I have other clients where I do work for them and legacy artists that have been passed away for 30 years and they're still putting out material, you know, pe people are, people are still buying that. It's still inspiring people, new people. So it's never a lost cause. So get even, you know, look at the, that, the, the guy, um, they made the film about him in the 70s. He was big in the early, or he wasn't, he was a musician in the early 70s. And then he made a record. He didn't get much play over here. He got into construction and then somehow his record got released in South Africa and he became a big artist in South Africa, but nobody knows him here. Did you see that film? Do you know no. what I'm talking about? No. So there's, there's these possibilities are there. So you know, like, um, 
as I still see uh, the young up and comers, you know, n it's not as much as it was obviously when we were kids because it was full on. So there's other things that are full on for them, but you still get the, the guys who are interested in engineering or music or, you know, pr production or writers. So still there, as long as it's pure and true. Um, and then there's a whole giant swath of people that love listening to the things that are made by electronics and yeah, stuff. Boy, so that's been a, when I was full on in KLOS, that was a big deal. When we went to digital and people ranting and raving, uh, records are much more sound accurate. Then you get CDs and it, just the whole ongoing, um, totally. it's not pure. The word was used. Let me, let me ask this question. That's a great word, by the way. Pure. I, I stand behind it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, and so I'm grateful you're here. One of the things I've always tried to do behind a microphone and you alluded to it at the beginning, I, I, I'm going to be very, um, non politically correct here. I have no tolerance for noise. I, I, I want, um, I want a cadence that speaks of God, whatever it is. That that's where my heart has always been, and my soul yearns for. That that, that said, excellence. Um, yes. Strive when you see all beings, whether it's the guy in the end zone or what you know, going for the jump shot or whatever it is. Yeah. That excellence. That that is a direct correlation to striving. Yeah. That that to me is by. That's how I view what God is. Yeah, basically. and the and ability it, for that. And in my circles, we give glory to God. That's what we do as Christians. Yeah. But, but here's where I wanted to go. There are some in my sphere. Drives me a little nuts. Uh, in this day and age of social media, where you got people with tons of followers. I saw a guy the other day. He just popped up on my timeline on Instagram, and represents himself as a Christian. And he's like another song of Satan and he plays stairway to heaven mm. and the whole back masking thing. And he's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. and I'm like, man, you're a fool. Yeah. But here's my question. Um, music is very influential. There is dark music. Um, but this whole idea that somehow, I mean, I mean, Elvis, Satan's in the rock and roll and he shakes his hips. You know, that's been kind of the yeah. age old cultural challenge. Can't let our kids watch any of this stuff. What's your take on that? Like when you play music, you, you, you go to the divine source in that well. And yet th there's some, um, I think it's in, uh, didn't they ban a chord in the middle ages? Yeah. Why? Yeah, talk well, about that a little bit. It, it, a mode, basically. So, and and you can all you're doing now. People who are non-musical, if there's anybody listening who's non-musical, um, this this goes for your entire how you operate your your life, basically. So this this it makes sense. This correlates, and basically, if you have a piano in front of you and you have the notes in front of you, and you just touch one, ding. Ding, 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 ding. You know, you're just go ahead and playing them. Pick two notes, play them together. You're going to know when they're supposed to go together and when they're not. Even if you don't know music, you will know because your biology will tell you. And two of them are going to sound like, oh, wow, this, that's nice. Like you will feel it in you. So um, that feeling, I guess, is, is kind of... <laughs> I don't know why somebody would want to make something to to drive another being uh, crazy or hurt them in some way. So it's how you use it, basically. So to me, I would never want to do anything like that. Um, you know, choose notes that are, you know, purposefully going to, you know, grade like fingernails on a chalkboard kind of thing. And I understand that, that, that there's subjective nuances within that to a degree, but there's certainly something that can be measured like, oh, he just got chills. Okay, do that again. Oh, he just got chills again. Like you can, oh, he, he just made his stomach buckle. You just shot six hertz at him, you know, with a lot of power, like, like right. how they break up riots and stuff and in right. and, you know, South right. America and stuff, you know, frequencies to just make you lose control of your bowel movements. Like there's all of these kinds of things. So 
I always tried to, to do the positive aspect of things. So what I learned from with music is like, if you're off or something's wrong, all you need to do is slightly pivot just a little bit and you're right next to the other note that'll save the day. So whatever the conflict is, whatever the consternation you're up against, slightly shift ever so slightly. Just to, You're usually a half a step away from being, oh, there it is. Okay, so you're very, very close. So perspectives, music clarified that for me because it just made me instantly go, oh, if I just move over one note, everything's better. And that goes with the way my, the flow of my body, my electrical system, my, like it's, it's a bi- biological, like you're feeling it as well. So not only did I consciously do it, but now I can feel what I consciously chose to do and I can feel, I feel better. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... I never listened to the first song on Van Halen 1. I don't even say the title of that song. I don't even know why they ever wrote that. It doesn't make any sense to me. I know why they wrote the music. I don't know why Dave wrote the lyrics like that. I don't understand it. But it is what it is, and it's their history and whatever. But for me, I, don't, I pretend that song doesn't exist. I'm not down with that. I don't want to be in that neighborhood. I don't want to hang out with that. I don't want nothing to do with it. So... Um, I stay away from things like that, and I think it's I think it 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 is powerful what you say in music, and you can make somebody do something with sound or visual. And I'll give you so a thought that I was share going to share earlier that I that I didn't finish was I just recently when my my parents trans uh, passed away I transferred all of their old eight millimeter films okay from my youth from the fifties the sixties and the seventies up till I was about seven years old. Two things that I found one thing was. I had video of me play or film footage of me playing drums when I'm like two years old. I had a drum kit in my room, a light blue drum kit. And what do I have at my place? A light blue drum. I never knew why I bought this custom blue drum kit. And now I see film of myself with a blue drum kit I never even remembered. So I started with drums. My older brother had a dr- drum kit and we shared a room. So I grew up with drums in the room. Um, that was a thought I wanted to finish. The other thing with the, 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 when in transferring the films, my mom is a teenager with all of her friends. She had a lot, a lot of friends. And so there's all of this, all of her life growing up, she was always in big groups of people. Well, all of a sudden, one day, all the girls now smoking cigs. Mm. So it, they just, they all obviously saw a movie mm. and now they're all, and, and now they're all acting, they're acting out on <laughs> the camera. And I'm like, what's going on? Who are these people? Because I've just seen years and years and years of them running around in the backyard or doing this or doing that. And now they're all glamorized and smoking cigs, acting like actors in movies. Mm-hmm. And that became so clear where it was like, this is literally overnight. Like these people, this we're talking, we're going back to the late thirties, forties. So no, this would have been in the forties where that's how marketing works. And so whether it's going to be some sort of, you know, evil, whatever term you want to use in the, it's going to leave a mark unless somebody has the consciousness to go, uh, uh-uh, I'm not taking you on. That's how I preserved myself with my clients over the years. I made every, when a client comes in, I say to myself, I make the declaration. I'm not taking on the energy of my, the art of my client. I can't do that. So I had to declare it. Like I had to get to the, first I had to do it over and over, lose nights and nights and nights of sleep with somebody's song is looping in my head. Oh boy. You have to learn how to shut that off. So I did that for years until I learned the skill set to go, uh uh-uh, turn off, or I'm not taking on this energy. So these are the things that music taught me. And you think, how did music teach you that? I never was seeking it out. I inadvertently did it for self-preservation, and music showed me the way. So when I started my studio business, I never wanted to do that. I just didn't want to be out in the nine to five and I had a studio and I had the gear and I had the knowledge. So it was like, okay, well, let's do this. But then it was like, no, you're going to get all of your life's lessons because of that decision you just made. Yeah. This isn't just about the band coming in or the artist. No. Every artist who comes in speaks differently. Yeah. Has different terminology. Depends on what part of the world they come from. You know, they see, they, they see things differently, even though it's a chorus. 
and they call it the hook or whatever it may be or or the b section or you know what i mean or whatever so uh music is a way i think like anything except well no i mean as i think about it even an apple hanging on a tree has the ability if you really think about it to move you physically mm -hmm. let alone once you taste it your biology but even to be in the space of it like you know, there's something special about this tree. You, you grafted it, you put it in, you chose the soil, you water it, you keep it clean or whatever. You put the squirrel guard on it or the deer stuff so the deer don't eat or whatever you do, you know, you're, so it, it, there's a, something that goes with all of that uh, time that you're taking and spending with it. Yeah, your analogy fits. And also in, in our circles, man, the tree and the apple going back a couple thousand years it's it's a big, it's a big one that's when it all started and and let me let me jump forward here Craig Parker Adams is my guest I want to be cognizant of time we got maybe 15 20 more minutes we're just going wherever we go um, do you ever think about in future tense like where you want to be in a year from now or five years from now or ten years from now um, as a as a man who follows Christ, um, I, I believe when I gave my life to him, it's about denying myself and following him, which doesn't mean I'm, you know, boring. I'm, I'm just somehow some uptight Christian who just preaches the gospel. What I do is I, I live my gifts out fully and give God all the glory. And it, I don't know, I, I couldn't live in this day and age with everything going on if I didn't have my king. Jesus. What about Craig Parker Adams? Do you think about the future much? Do you think about, you know, I, I would like to fill in the blank? Where, where do you see your life's direction? So, so I do do that. Um, and the technique that I use, I actually, um, I call it my deathbed priorities. Wow. And so I many, uh, oftentimes, um, I've, I've had experiences in, in my life where I feel as though that I, uh, from those experiences that I, I understand and I actually know what the death process is, like I've experienced it. And it's, I've, I have the awareness to uh, pay attention to the cognition. Like I know it, like my body, like that's how I perceive it. Okay. Now I, I, I could always be delusional. I always have to put that up there. I don't know everything, but within every being of my understanding, I believe that I understand that process and that I've experienced it and, I, and, the, and the lingering memory of it is there. So I have access to it. And I think the reason why that is for me is to really get a great bite out of this experience as much as I can in terms of what I'm gonna contribute and what I can get from it, both, okay? Um, you can think of it as, how do I make this a win-win equation? Sooner or later, I'm going to have to leave the body. I know that. I've seen it happen. It's going to, it's just, that's the way it is. So, I don't want to have any regrets of unfinished business. Now, regrets, hey, I got in a fight with my dad when I was 16. He had me on the floor and he was about, you know what I mean? I was holding his hands because I, I upset him by antagonizing my mom. You know what I mean? I regret that. I was stupid. I, I, I apologized to him and her a thousand times over sure. when I moved out of the house throughout my life. You know what I mean? All of those things. So I'm not talking about those sorts of things, everybody. We all have those regrets. We all wish we could do them and I do them over and learn from them. And I think that's right where you want to be. You want to be from the, oh, I could do this way better now if I had another chance. Like, I think that's a great spot to be in. But if you can also be in, the, in that as close as you can in the moment, like, okay, I'm really looking at everything. I'm not letting anything go by me. I'm really aware of all of this. I want to use it for everything I can and, you know, contribute to it as well. So um, in that sense, I think about how I want to reflect when I'm on my deathbed. I want to be, how do I want to experience this death process for this life? I want to be able to look back and have all of those great memories from the varying things that I was interested in doing, all of the um, 
forgivenesses that I was a part of, both giving, offering forgiveness and, and then offering self-forgiveness, which is a huge one. Um, I want all of those things to be completely dealt with and, and smoothed in my situation. And so far they are, because I, I, I learned that after working with you originally 15, 16 years ago when we first met, um, you got me right on track very quickly. It was unbelievable. Uh, it, you know, I, I had from just our first couple meetings, I remember feeling, sharing really intimate things with you that I just needed, I needed that big brother. I needed that person there to hear, hear me out and then say, okay, well, let's take a look at this. And here's, you know, all of that was life changing for me. So I've had plenty of years to look at myself and go, uh, that's going to linger. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, you have unfinished business. Take care of it. Do not postpone. Do not postpone. So that's how I try to do it now. Um, and, uh, just like, um, something I'd like to say about Christ or Jesus, sure. as it relates to my entire life, the source of strength for my mom through her life and my mother-in-law was so incredible that I didn't really, I didn't have the understanding of how their lives with the church actually were. Why? They both went to school before the mid 1950s. Mm -hmm. Things changed, especially in the Catholic church mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. So what, what I saw as a kid is not what they saw as a kid. And so what they, when they would speak to me, I'll say my mom or whatever. And it's like, well, you're trying to relate something to me from your experience from a few decades ago. And it's not like that right now. It's not, you know, so there was, when I was a kid, there was differences and whatnot. As I grew older from looking at the, the example, I understood how that was the very force of my mom's existence and looking at, like I said, they passed away. I found my, my sister passed away when I was 13, my adopted sister. She was 18. This was 1982. So I find notebooks that my mom had. She was journaling at the time when my sister passed away. My sister and my mom were the only girls in the family, three, three men and two girls. Well, my mom lost her little girl. She had a hereditary disease. If I, I just wish I had, uh, I was older to be able to help my mom through the process because reading her words of the pain and suffering she was going through at the time, she felt completely isolated. The only female in the house, that was one thing. And then just, it just went on and on and on all these things. And I always felt very open, talked to her about these kinds of, you know, whatever. Like we had a very open kind of uh, relationship all the time. But there were certain things that she felt that she couldn't talk about. So she had to journal them. Mm -hmm. but so I, reading them later and then understanding her relationship with God, Christ, all of that, it was the most beautiful thing in her existence. It made it so she could get through her life, you know? And so I always look to the beauty of her example and her life. So basically, I know I'm like just rambling, but this relates to what you asked. I look at all the best examples in my life and I try to learn from them. I go to my deathbed pretty often, uh, a few times a year, when I need to reassess and take notes and really look at my situation and make sure I'm, I'm on course for what I want. That's the technique I use. I recommend it to, to whatever anybody's technique, as long as you're looking at, you know, how you want to end up or, you know, think sure. about your future. Also being married, that's a concern. I want her to be covered in every possible way if I can swing it. You know what I mean? So I want to make sure everything's handled in, in that case. Outside of those sorts of things at my age now, I really feel complete. This record was the big thing. And completing it, Edward was supposed to hear this record upon completion, but he passed away. I didn't get it completed in time. He told me he was, he was, he, he said, if, if I was an inspiration to you in any way at all, that's enough for me. But he was to hear the record. I have to live with him not hearing the record. 
It's okay. You know, I felt like I've done what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And so right now I just, I'm really interested in expanding the conversation and my understanding about the things I think I know and I don't know. You know, I'm just trying to get rid of my delusions and get get schooled on things. I'm looking for, you know, the big brother. I always, I always look for the mentor. Mentors are huge. It's like, they're just huge. Everybody needs a mentor. You know, um, you got to have mentors. Sitting with Pastor um, Josh a um, number of weeks ago, I don't know why, but I, I got into this rap about elders. Yeah. And we look at our culture now, and there's no reverence or respect for older people, let alone their By design, design, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Let alone their experience, their knowledge, yeah. um, their it's wisdom. It's the gold, man. That's where the gold's at. And okay. here we are. And and maybe we'll have you back on down the road, and we can, we can lean into culture because y- y- you got your oars in the water in a lot of areas about life, you know, in my days, um, in the spiritual pursuits that I had, consciousness was a big word. You strive every day to be here now and conscious and you you take care of business. You're not just checked out, um, pushing your album, want to be big and none of that stuff. Like so many of the youth in this day and age, because they didn't grow up with a moral foundation. They grow up with, I mean, the world that my son is growing up in is all screen views and, and who's the latest. And I mean, where's somebody to say time out and let's just go for a walk and smell the air. The, the, the people with the awareness is who, who know that. I mean, I understand it. Oh, well, you ask the young kid, Hey, Let's go do this. Oh, I want to play this. I want to play. Like, sure, there's going to be some sort of adversity or something or whatever, but you got to at least try, you know. Um, and uh, it's just mentors and sharing. I, this is a saying I've always said. If you want to do the absolute best you can do, if you want to pay the most respect to the up-and-comers, you do that by paying the most respect to the generation that came before you. That's how you set the example. You pay the respects to the people who came before you and you let the younger ones see you do it. And then they learn that's how it's done. So you got to set the example or they don't know. So there's not a lot of examples. I mean, obviously there are, but in the big scheme of basically what we're talking about and the, the devices and the gadgets, Those things are designed to distract you by their very design. So if you don't understand the technology that's being used, then it's just a, it's a, it's a thing that can take you over or you can take it over. Mm. So you have to, you know, so if you, people got to go, Hey kid, I I don't think I would do that. You know, uh, (laughs) you sure you want to do that? Well, how about, you know, it's it's like, you got to keep an eye out and lean in when you can. And sure. Lots of people will say no, but in spirit of the ones who didn't care about what others said. Oh, amen. In, in, in their honor, you do it. You just do it, you know, and, and let the reaction be whatever, whatever it is. Chips are going to fall where they fall. Yeah, they're, they're, hoping, they're hoping to knock people out of wanting to lend a hand. Hmm. No. Uh-uh. I'm going to just keep doing it, you know. Just So that's kind of... I don't know. Craig Parker Adams is my guest. I want to share a quick story and then we'll put the, uh, the ribbon on as it were for now. I know you well enough. Uh, you are grateful for the time I mentored you. And I've told you this before. And I want to tell our viewers and our listeners something that transpired where you were integral in, in a sense leading a time in my life where I was at a crossroads. So it goes like this. So I become a follower of Christ in 2009. Everything changes. I'm at a rock station. I'm on a raunchy morning show. What am I doing? Craig and I were still spending time together. 
And I became very quiet, stopped my new age lectures. I'm sure they're not going to do that anymore. Just life kind of falling apart. And I don't remember how it transpired, but some time went by and you said to me, you need to do a YouTube video. And I, it never even entered my mind. And you said, without hesitation, we'll do it here. We'll shoot it here. And I'm like, what am I going to say? You go, this talk about how your life has changed. So I think it's still on YouTube. My first early testimony, there's two clips on YouTube that would have never happened if it wasn't for you saying, hey, and you led me through the questions and just off camera said, hey, talk about this. That was the integral moment where the foundation for my life as a follower of Christ began. Right. Where you probably don't even know, it's the first time in my concern I realized it's okay to talk about Christ. Because even back then, I was a New Age guru. People were calling me Judas and, you know, Sontag's is a Jesus freak. He's lost it. And so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying thank you for being in my life and thank you for mentoring me. And, and I, I just know that uh, I have the utmost gratitude for you um, and Maria. And we've been through a lot together. We go in cycles. We didn't talk for a while. Now we're talking. Your al new album is Vistale Buell. Uh, CraigParkerAdams.com is the website. You've got other clips and stuff on there as well. Um, any final thoughts? And uh, I'm just going to tag it with this. Um, are you going to do any live performances? Yeah. So th that's where what I'm actually in the process of right now is the studio where I'm at um, is not conducive for me to be rehearsing my band there, like the old studio that I had. So I have to find a spot in and it's up in the air with whether we relocate our whole operation, you know, where we're living and everything, or do I just get some other place or do I just, you know, book a series of rehearsals and start doing gigs. So basically I'm at the place right now where I am all set to now start rehearsing and get out and play. I have, everything is lined up. I have all of the merch. I got everything. It's just sitting there in boxes. You know what I mean? And it's like, I got to go out and I got to sell it. And if it's, if I stink, nobody wants it. Hey, that's a reality. Or if I can, you know, pass it on to somebody great, you know, so that is coming up. Yes, I have to do that. Um, and also to, um, uh, digital like online performances as well. So all of that is being uh, increased this year. Um, so, and we've already started, that's already begun. I've already made the purchases of the, the new camera that I'm using for most of the stuff to, um, and, and everything else. So that's all going on. Um, so yeah, I will be playing out. Um, with regards to the other things that you had said, um, when, when, when you had your experience and, and authentically, I, I saw what it did, like, I could see it, I knew what it was, right? And so, to me, it was very special, it was very beautiful. So I was, I was, uh, it's, when you're in the presence of something beautiful, incredible, you love it, you want to, you know, experience it, you want to share it, and all of that. So it was very beautiful, very beautiful, you know, experience for that, let alone, and I always have to remind you of this, because you, you weren't even, you weren't even present, I don't think, when you got baptized. And I was there, you know, for that. I didn't let any of that stuff get in the way of us. Yeah. I'm too smart for that. Yeah. Because I understand there's nothing to be afraid of with that. The, the idea is how you use these things to be the best being you can be. So that's really what it is for me. So if you remember when we were doing that, we, you and I started our own men's group for a period of time. We sure did. And we would have about 14, sometimes 12 to 18 guys come to my studio, sit around in a big circle and hash it out, whatever we wanted to talk about. And we're talking all walks of life, all types of financial levels, all ethnicities, races, whatever. We're all there. And there was a few times where Christ was brought up. Yep. And we were like, man, isn't it insane how the whole entire energy of the room just 
changed. Yeah. I'm like, what is, <laughs> what is this? She's, you, I mean, you can't not notice it. I mean, it's definitely there. And so really what you're dealing with is everybody's life's experiences and baggage through their filter with how it relates to whatever their religious experiences are. Yeah. That's just too much convoluted, uh, quantum entanglement where it's like, yeah, I don't even go there. There's no point in even doing that. This is why it comes back to notes and harmony. I can feel where you're coming from. My best friends are the ones where I tell them, your heart precedes you by 30 feet. Mm. I can feel you from across the room, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm, I that's, do. Yeah. And, and so that's where it's at. So that's what I'm responding to. What name you want to put on it, it's long, to me, it's, it's everything that's beautiful in existence. So I gravitate towards that stuff. And I don't, I don't shy away from any of that sort of stuff. But I know when I walk into a room and it smells, it's like, I don't want to be in here. Mm. I, don't, I don't need to smell it any longer. I know. <laughs> there it is. I'm out. <laughs> you know? yep. and, and that's how I exist. And that relates to God, Jesus, religion, parents, Adopted, music, notes, everything. It's just all, it, it, uh, it's great. It's all there. And bring it, bring, bring it, bring it on. All the, the glory and the beautifulness. And I feel as though we're due. I kind of, this is a, probably a wrong thing to say, but I feel as though we're owed some goodness. Now, isn't that, that's kind of like, a, I almost should be slapped in the face for such a statement. Because it's like, look around, man. Look how good you got it. But you know what I mean? I feel like there's been a lot of bad energies that have just been put on us here uh, in, the, in this world, and they don't need to be there. Yeah. They could be removed. There's a better way to exist. Yeah, and that's, that's a conversation for another time. But in my circles and my men's ministry, that, that's, that's where we get into the concept of spiritual warfare. Yeah. That in the spiritual realm, there are dark forces, and man, they are... As Malcolm used to say, they have come home to roost. They're everywhere. There's a lot of bad mojo out there. Yeah. And people are getting lost. And and yet, God, my Lord, sa Savior, Jesus, you know, there's a lot of words, life source, whatever. People have their own little thing. Um, in the end, uh, you know, Jesus is coming back. He's going to right all wrongs. But the point being, I agree with you, man. This is a... This is a time where I'll say this in closing and then any last final word you've got. Um, a friend of mine who has a big church in Texas, one of the sweetest, oldest guys, you talk about an elder. He's been through the battle and he told me when the start of the lockdowns began and that whole push that you and I have had conversations off air about, you know, the, the ruse that we were, that there were, was, perpetrated on us he used an analogy that was kind of funny he said well here's the deal he said you're going to see who's really naked when the waves start going out to sea and we're going to find out who people really are and i think we're in that time now where just by the very circumstances in life with dark forces people are being challenged to really go deep and who am i what am i doing here yeah Instead of going the way of what the government says or the experts say, because we've tried that. And I mean, we live in California, man. Yeah, yeah. We, we've seen how that, that experiment goes. It doesn't go too well. No. So we've got to find ourselves. And uh, I just know that the Lord loves everybody and he's the answer to everything. I am blessed to have you here. We could have gone a lot longer and gone in all sorts of other avenues. Is there anything on your heart you want to just share in closing? Anything left unsaid that you want to share? Again, your album is at your site. Go to CraigParkerAdams.com. Vistali Buell is the name of the album. Any final? Um, yeah, I'd like to share that. Um, a year ago, I was lucky enough to go up to one of the uh, men's groups that you and KMG do. And that was a very... I've, I've had my fair share of uh, kind of uh, impactful life experiences. And that one was particularly special.
because it's kind of like when you get re-reminded of, hey, are you still judging a book by its cover? Mm -hmm. I mean, you haven't got beyond that one yet. You know, that, that happens, at least for me, it's happened multiple, multiple times in my life where I learned that lesson long ago. So why am I back here again, learning it again, right? So what I was reminded of or what I experienced there was kind of, it was very, very special. And why? I saw people's lives change. Like, that's how I perceived it. I saw some very powerful things. So if there's anything I would like to impart to the listener, it's that no matter what you are going through, no matter how bad it is, in what avenue of existence or life it is, there you're very close. You're just a half step away from turning it into something different. So you're not stuck. Don't think you're stuck. Find somebody to talk to, reach out to Frank, listen to these, whatever, do something. You're not stuck. Just don't be stuck. Okay. That's, that's the only thing. If there's one person out there who feels stuck, please, you're not stuck. Just do a, do a conscious behavior. Basically you choose, choose a behavior to do something in the direction you want to go, just something. And hopefully you can get a hold of a mentor or somebody to help you just get over the bump. Don't stop. Don't quit. Take a breath. It's okay. Break time comes. It's okay. Just endure. There's a way that, you know, so I just want to, th that's the only thing I would basically say is to somebody out there is feeling a little under the weather, a little down. No, 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 no. We're here. For, yeah. So just wind in your sail. F f just don't quit there. You know, it's, it'll, whatever that thing is, whatever, just keep going. It'll yeah. show up in one way or another. It, Amen. Just, it just does. So. My expression is God's not missing anything. There you go. He's, he's everything. That's it. Yeah. And you made reference to our man camp. Ironically, we've got another one coming up in March. We're trying to get guys motivated to go up on the mountains and breathe some clean air and leave your cell phones home. And uh, the stories are amazing. Yeah. No cell phones. <laughs> well, but, uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I heard a guy coming in today who's got a book he's pushing. It's smartphones. Don't give hugs. Yeah. <laughs> no. And, the, and, and not only that, they leave all sorts of little right. sinister things behind like tumors and other things. Of that they sure nature. do. So they sure do. Gotta be careful, brother. Thank you for making the trek. My pleasure. It was uh, a good time. Um, and we can find you at craigparkeradams.com. Yep. And uh, those of you watching this, this is uh, the Frank Sontag podcast. You can find us on all the usual places, specifically YouTube. I'm on Instagram at uh, Frank Sontag and my ministry, KMG Ministries. And my dear brother, Craig Parker Adams, this is... Uh, it's been a holy moment. Thank you for being here. It's been my pleasure, and it's, I love the place. Congratulations on the new podcast, yes. and uh, thanks, David, for the great engineering work and all of that, and yep. I'm just having a great time. Good to be here. Thanks for playing for us, too, uh, a little bit. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> my pleasure. God bless you all. Until next time, thank you for watching the Frank Sontag Podcast. <laughs>